Aloha everyone, this is Steven Chong of the Tokyo Aquascaping Union. It has been a long time since I've uploaded and I apologize for that. But today I've got good news, good news that many of you have already probably heard at this point. But uh, the results for the IAPLC 2020, that's the International Aquatic Plant Layout Contest, the biggest planted aquarium and aquascaping contest in the world, um, just released its results for its 20th anniversary contest and I was honored to receive the gold prize Stephen Chong rank 2 in the world. So the IPLC is a little bit weird that gold is rank 2. Um, grand prize went to Shaq Riel, my buddy from Malaysia. Um, definitely go check out the entire stream from ADA. I'll leave a link in the description. And um, also check out Green Aqua's um, video going over the results too. It's hilarious. Um, those guys add a bit of new to everything. So Today, I'm going to make a video about my aquascape, and specifically, I'm going to try to get into the main question that's been swamping me all over every bit of social media I look at, which is like, Stephen, how did you make those crazy reflections, uh, those crazy water surfaces below the actual water inside the aquarium? Stephen is my favorite. Those puddles are insane. His puddles are insane. In my theory, I do believe they are created by mirage effect with light refracted on the blank surface of the glass. Stephen Chung was the best this year. I love how he messed with my mind with those reflections. So, um, I'm going to get to that. But in order to get to that, I'll have to make, a, um, I'll have to answer three different questions. First of which, why did I do this? Second of which is, uh, how do they fit into the overall um, construction layout. I'm actually going to do a video talking about the main build of the hardscape, the main construction of the aquascape overall. And the third question is probably the one that people are most interested in. What are the actual technical aspects? What is the technique? How did I develop it in order to create sort of a water surface inside of the aquarium? And I think I'm going to get to that last question in the third video because you really can't appreciate um, it's hard to appreciate how I got there and why the technique is useful unless you understand everything that went into it up until that point. The conceptual work of, you know, what was my reasoning, why did I actually even do this, is critical to understand, um, you know, what I was doing in terms of putting the reflections together. And then, second of all, you have to understand how they fit into the overall composition of the aquascape um, in order to you know, appreciate, again, why it is that I set up the reflections the way I did and how I went about doing that. So, um, the actual technical aspect of putting the um, reflections together will be featured in the third video of a series of three. And um, first, I'm going to get into in this video um, what it is that I wanted to express with this aquascape and why is it that I ended up making these reflections inside of the aquarium. So, uh, like every year, I talk a lot about my inspiration, the story I went to, um, all the things that I was looking through and thinking about in order to prepare for the aquascape. Remember guys, um, for me, I've talked about this in several places in my videos and Green Aqua's videos, but um, the process of storyboarding, thinking about what it is that I want to make, um, what it is that I want to express, what is my big idea for the aquarium, that is the major part of the work. Um, hardscape design, planting husbandry, etc. The husbandry and actual filling of the aquarium, in this case, took two months. The hardscape build took three months-ish, but that's still less than half of the entire year. So, in other words, seven out of the 12 months were almost completely dedicated to just thinking about what it is that we're going to build in the aquarium, um, what it is that I want to talk about in the aquascape. And that's why I keep talking about it so much every year. It's because this is the really important portion. So for my aquascapes, some reason I always end up um, with an ocean inspiration or getting a huge hint from like ocean photos. In 2018, I was looking at overhang pictures like this one of um, you know reefs and fish swimming under the reef. It gave me the idea of you know getting into a fish's perspective when building an aquascape. You know, aquascapes are places that fish live in and people look at. Amano-san always said that, you know, a first-class aquascaper 
is one who can recapture nature in the aquarium. A true master is one who can fool the fish. And so I always thought it was really, or especially looking at these reef photos in 2018, I had the idea that in order to create a really great aquascape, you needed to be able to put the audience into a fish's mindset or a fish's perspective, even if just for a moment. Um, this is an inspiration I took over into the next two aquascapes. Um, the one after that, the ocean inspiration I got was actually from one of Amano-san's um, algae photos, a photo of water washing over algae. And the uh, composition he used, I ended up using in my 2019 aquascape. This year, what I was looking at primarily in ocean inspiration were sunken vessels. So, pictures like this one, or this one, uh, where people are inside of the boat, um, peering out into the world outside. And there's a few things that I think are just really cool about sunken ships, which is, first of all, it's a dark um, inspiration. And that's something I really wanted, you know, to make good use of shadows, to make good use of um, a feeling of, you know, after 2019, when I lost to Josh and forgot us on, both of them told me, you know, you need the fear of nature. Shizen no osorosa. Um, this is an idea that originally came from Fukada-san. And yeah, like a dark feeling, a scaring feeling. Um, and so I was looking for inspirations that had that quality. Um, going back to the ocean and thinking about sunken vessels was an idea that came to me. And looking through, I was like, yeah, it's cool because there's so many dark, treacherous aspects, emotional tense to this inspiration. But... The great thing about this compared to, say, um, the idea of being inside of a log, like if you were going to take Fukada san's 2018 layout where he had the white Anubius in the, in the stump and just expand that to be the entire aquascape, which, is one, which was an idea that I had at one point. But in that case, if you're going inside of a regular stump, the whole aquascape would just be black because there's the walls of the wood, right? Uh, but in, the, the hint that I took away from sunken ships is that, you know, you can be inside of a dark space, but there can be lots of holes from which you can show the person the outside world, which will keep the overall aquascape bright. And more importantly, they're like creating interesting windows, pockets of places that you can show a new face of the aquascape. Um, in Josh's lecture at Green Aqua, he said, you know, as much as possible, you want to give people something new to look at, which I always thought was something, um, <laughs> skulls, <laughs> definitely getting into the fear of nature, huh? So, um, but yeah, having so many things to show people can be really, it can't, that's like kind of a tricky hint for a beginner, because for most beginners, what they really need to do is just focus in on the one thing and not get distracted. But if you are able to, say, organize um, many different views and many different stories into a coherent way, like say that you have um, a, sunken, a sunken ship and all of the rest of the windows are connected by being a consistent outside world, uh, and they're connected together by having this main structure that anchors the entire layout, then you might be able to show the viewer many new faces of nature while also uh, not getting them too distracted and lost uh, by showing them too many different things. That was my thinking. Uh, those are the ideas I took away from um, sunken ships. Oh, and one other thing. A cool thing about sunken boats is that um, if you have a sunken ship, then it becomes like a structure where many different life forms um, come to attach themselves and live. You've got um, boats that are just surrounded by fish and crusted with coral. It's, to me, a really cool idea that even though the ship has been um, destroyed, it's gone. Uh, it becomes a new habitat for living things. Um, and I thought that that concept was also one I wanted to bring over to my aquascape. And I realized, like, the only structure that I could make that kind of has a, a shape, an original function, an original purpose outside of just being um, a bunch of um, a structure, right, would be like a dead tree because 
you know, if you just, you can make anything out of rocks, but a rock is not a living thing. A rock doesn't, um, it's part of the landscape. It, of course, it's natural for rocks to take different shapes as, you know, um, nature wears on it. But a rock doesn't have its own life story. Whereas a tree, wood has its own life story. Every piece of wood that you have um, was once alive and had original function belonging to that living thing of the tree. So um, going back to my aquascape, you can see it, I think, if you look again. But I wanted to create the inside of a dead tree, which would be like the space that belongs to the fish, bringing you into that fish eye perspective, the fish's mindset, uh, putting you in this dark place with its own original story. The title of the work, Undying, comes from the fact that even though the tree has died, it still lives as the new habitat for the plants and fish that congregate together to make that space their own. And I took the inside from the sunken boat to create windows to show the audience something new, a new face of nature. And this base structure is what's really important about um, conceiving how to put the aquascape together. Um, everyone, the first thing that they see when they look at the aquascape will be you know, the plants, the reflection. Oh my god, the reflection, the green and black. And, the, uh, and the, what is that, right? That's what um, people were saying all the time. What is that? But you have to realize there's a lot of conceptual work that goes into you know, making this really stand out and really important. And not only stand out, but work with the rest of the aquascape, um, not getting the audience distracted, and you know, really making these spaces come alive. Um, so once I had that base structure of the wood, um, the, the idea of a sunken piece of wood, a sunken, uh, a sunken ship as like the main framing of the entire aquascape, I had to think to myself, what am I going to show outside of the log? Because, uh, you know, you, you can create this world inside, but if the outside world is not cohesive, uh, the whole escape falls, to, falls apart. And more importantly, if these are windows into an outside world, then it's really important that you nail the windows, that those windows are easy to understand, um, easy to read, they don't confuse the audience, they hold together consistently, um, and most importantly, that they're beautiful, that they show something really impressive. So I went through countless scenes of nature thinking about what it is that I want to make outside. Is it going to be cliffs? Is it going to be a desert? Is it going to be fallen trees? Is it going to be um, another underwater aquascape? A true underwater work like my one last year. Like I could have made flowing branches that are going in the same direction as the rest of the wood uh, and made it a one-to-one -one perspective aquascape. Bunch of different ideas. None of them really gelled with me. None of them really seemed to have a lot of impact um, until I came to pictures of swamps. Specifically, I was looking at cypress swamps and swamps in the Everglades in Florida. And I saw pictures like this with the trees being reflected on the surface of the water. Like this. Coming back to these types of pictures, I think, you, God, that's still really, really interesting. You know, the I. Um, the image of straight reflection of a tree on the surface of the water. It's a really interesting image. And coming back to it, I thought, you know what, this, is, this might be what I'm looking for. This might be the thing that I need in my aquascape to tie it together. Um, there's a lot of different strengths to this. Uh, first of all, it's a really beautiful image. And second of all, it's really, really easy to understand especially for the aquascaping audience, especially for the people who would be sitting on the judging panel. Why? Well, I have Josh Sim to thank for that. In 2009, Josh introduced uh, straight wood forest aquascapes to the hobby. In this, his, two, his 2009 first entry to the IAPLC World Rank 4 
Um, and ever since this layout, and people called Josh crazy at the time for using straight up and down wood. At the time, it was completely unheard of in a nature aquarium. But, you know, after that, like, for instance, this is a grand prize layout from 2012, I believe, that, you know, builds off of Josh's original idea. Um, so ever since that, you know, there's countless aquascapes that have used the same theme. Here's one from AGA last year that won the most, uh, won the most innovative award. But the, the point I'm trying to get at is that people are used to seeing this. I would not have to um, second guess whether or not my audience would be able to understand what it is that's going outside. As long as I use those theme of the standing trees, um, they would, uh, anyone would be able to tell in an instant what they are. And I wouldn't have to be, you know, like trying to lower the hurdle. I wouldn't be struggling to make it easy to understand. I can just look, there's standing tall trees. You guys all know what it is. And um, so that wouldn't be something that people had to work hard on their brain. They could just focus on the new thing I was showing them, which would be the reflections. Uh, all the attention could go there and, you know, not distract. Now, the other great thing about this is that it would work with not only the reflection on the bottom of the aquarium, but the reflection everywhere on the surface, on the side of the glass, um, there would be one consistent element connecting all of the windows together, which is this vertical line shape. Um, whether it's on the very far left and reflecting into the um, side glass, whether it was on the surface of the water reflecting um, against the water surface, whether it was in the viewpoint, at, or even in this case, since I have the reflection, the greatest thing about this um, theme is that I can draw a vertical line all the way from the top of the paint to the very, very bottom of it. Usually this space here in the mid-ground and foreground is reserved for pebbles and um, rock work and sand work. So you're not able to, say, create a vertical line uh, with a tree here unless you place like a tree in the foreground. Or you're not able to bring um, another way of saying this is you're not able to bring the outside world into the inside world. This was a technical problem for me because using this framework, the sunken tree, as the anchor for my aquascape, um, I was at a real risk of creating a major disconnect between what was going outside and what was going inside, um, like that these things wouldn't gel together. But... I realized that if I used um, reflections of trees as my theme, the outside world of the standing trees would continue all the way into the inside world, this foreground space and midground space that usually would be completely disconnected. It would have to be something different, right? It would be pebbles, it would be sand, it would be plants, like the way that it looks here. That would be the only thing being used on the bottom unless I got reflections. With reflections, the outside world is connected to the inside world. Every single window is connected by the same theme, uh, but I can show different faces of the swamp in every single window and no one would get lost in the theme. No one would get confused or be questioning what the theme is or wondering like um you know what is this outside world because everyone is so used to seeing josh's work to seeing um all the aquascapes that came after that using the standing trees um taking advantage of everyone's you know existing memory in order to create consistency for my aquascape while showing them something completely new and different the gimmick of the reflections on the bottom of the aquascape. Um, this was to me the real innovation of this layout. Um, and what I'm really proud of um, in putting it all together. And I think that I was able to succeed taking rank two by, <laughs> you know, um, getting everyone to understand. And I think the last thing that I want to leave you guys with is that um, the hint that I got from this aquascape was that 
Um, if you're going to do a crazy gimmick like this, um, what you should do is create a new face of nature. Um, see, this isn't the first time that uh, mirrors, and yes, they are mirrors, used in order to um, create those reflections. Um, this isn't the first time mirrors are used in high-level aquascapes. Um, in 2016, Tanaka Katsuki pioneered the technique by putting mirrors on the bottom of his aquarium. He put one big mirror plate on the bottom of his aquarium and constructed everything on top of that. But you can see that he mostly used it to create this kind of crazy white flash effect. Um, I think it's really cool. I interpret it as like a flowing stream or the energy from flowing water. But a lot of the judges didn't. They just thought it was this crazy canyon thing or um, explosion, cool special effect. So Tanaka Katsuki-san used the uh, he used the mirror to make this crazy white flashing effect. Um, in two thousand and eighteen, Bernard Hosta also used a mirror in his work um, to recreate Amano Takashi's um, pond inside of his garden. Uh, so I knew at that point that, you know, mirrors in a high-level aquascape was totally legit. They weren't going to um, discount what I had made just by using this kind of artificial effect. But I would use the gimmick in a way that neither Tanaka Katsuki did, nor Bernard Hosta did. I would use this as an extra canvas, um, an extra place to draw something. Even if it was an artificial gimmick, if I could use it, in order to show a new face of nature, you know, something that people had never seen before um, in an aquascape that was truly connected to expressing nature and loving nature, that would make the gimmick way more powerful in my mind. Um, it would make it way more meaningful to people, especially for this 20th anniversary IPLC. Uh, so guys, there's my explanation. I hope it was useful for you. In part two, I'm going to be talking about the overall construction of the aquascape, focusing on the construction of these windows, um, how it is that we came to making these windows, and now you know kind of idea of why we made them. All right, so please join us for part two in setting up the structure to show these reflections. If you haven't already, like, comment, subscribe, I promise I'm going to try to keep up with my videos. Alright, take it easy guys.